Good afternoon, everyone. I am Gabriel Ottavio, and I have the great pleasure to welcome and to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Burke, who will deliver a lecture on the topic Intellectuals in Exile, Challenges and Responses. As it has already been said, today's lecture is um, the first of a cycle of public events uh, that have been organized within the framework of the Jean Monnet project, European uh, societies and academic freedom, coordinated by Professor Esther Gallo, who will serve today as a discussant together with uh, Professor Rosa Salzberg. So, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Professor Burke on behalf of the organizing committee for having accepted our invitation to inaugurate this uh, cycle of public events. I think we couldn't have wished a better start. But before uh, introducing uh, our guest uh, would like to very briefly go over the program of this afternoon. We will have, um, after the keynote, two brief uh, reactions by our discussants, followed by response, as it work. And then we will uh, open the floor to questions from the audience, starting from the participants in the room, but also those who are attending the event online can raise questions. Uh, writing them down in the chat bar, and then we will report the questions to Professor Burke. Um, professor Burke is uh, Emeritus Professor of Cultural History at Emmanuel College at Cambridge University, and his education is um, closely linked to the history of the city of Trento. If I may quote him, he was brought up as post-Tridentine Catholic, before the Second Vatican Council, and his doctoral research was on Paolo Sarpi uh, as a historian, so the author of the famous Historia del Concilio Tridentino, which was put on index by the church, apropos talking uh, about academic freedom and uh, research freedom. In 1962, so by the way, the year when Trento was uh, instituted the Faculty of Sociology, Professor Burke was one of the first junior lecturers to be appointed at the University of Sussex, where he remained there for 17 years. He moved then to Cambridge in 1979, where he became professor of cultural history. Um, he has also been a visiting scholar in different places in the world, in Berlin, Brussels, Canberra, Groningen, Heidelberg, Los Angeles, Nijmegen, the Netherlands, in uh, Paris and Sao Paulo. And for most of his career, he has been uh, working on the cultural and social history of early modern Europe. But in recent years, he has extended his investigations uh, to include also other areas of the world, like Brazil and the 20th century. Most of his books have established themselves as essential guidebooks. Uh, to what cultural and uh, social historians do and how they do it. And among the impressive list of publications, I will only recall here a few of them, Cultural and Society in Renaissance Italy, Popular Culture in Early Modern Europe, The Fabrication of Louis XIV, The Art of Conversation, A Social History of Knowledge, two volumes, uh, Eyewitnessing, Exile and expropriates in the history of knowledge, which is to the topic of our of this keynote. The polymath, a cultural history from Leonardo da Vinci to Susan Sontag. And as I learned uh, yesterday night, the next book, his next book will be out next January. It's a social history of ignorance, a very challenging topic. So most of his books have been translated into different languages. And thanks to the, uh, to the um, library of our university, you can see projected on the screens of the department a list of uh, publications which have been translated in Italian. Without further ado, I leave the floor to Professor Burke. Thank you, Gabriele, for the generous introduction and not least the um, publicity for um, forthcoming book. So um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm hoping that you are hearing me loud and clear. 
six years ago when I published a book about the role of exiles in the history of knowledge, the subject was already a topical one. Since then, I think it's even more topical and maybe one could say that it's all too topical given the wave of migration that we've seen in the last few years. But my role here is really to remind you that the intellectual place of exiles has a very long history. So take the theme of seeking exile in search of freedom. In the middle of the 16th century, Venice was praised for its freedom by a Welsh Protestant visitor who wrote, I, I quote him, no man there marketh, that is, takes any notice of another's doing, nor meddleth with another man's living. No man shall ask thee why thou comest not to church. To live married or unmarried, no man shall ask thee why. Um, it, um, inversely, I believe that that statement casts a vivid light of what it would be like to live in a small Welsh town at, at that time. And But following the famous Concilio di Trento, the situation changed. Venice became less and less of a safe haven for unorthodox people. It was the turn, briefly, of the city of Antwerp to be praised for its great liberty, notably by a Venetian heretic and who was also a merchant, who's impressed by its freedom of speech and freedom of religion. But again, the situation changed in 1585. The Duke of Parma reconquered the city for Philip II and the Catholic Church. Well, Poland too was perceived as a zone of liberty at this time. It was nicknamed a state without stakes. Nobody would be burned for heresy in Poland. One a refugee from Venice, Giovanni Bonifacio, he advised a friend to come and join him in Krakow and keep writing as follows. Here you will have great liberty. I would say you have the very greatest liberty to think, debate, live, write, and publish. Once again, the situation changed a bit more slowly, but by the end of the 16th century, it was no longer safe to go to Poland if you were not a good Catholic. In any case, exile always has a price, social and psychological. In the past, it already presented major challenges to new arrivals, just as it does now. So it's the challenges I would like to discuss here relatively briefly, so as to give the maximum space to the, what I think of as the more exciting story, the creative responses of exiles to the difficulties in their new way of life, their life in what, in, um, to use a, a very new English word, um, we now call the place that immigrants arrive in, the host land in opposition to the homeland. So in what follows, I'll fo focus on the middle of the 20th century, and in particular, on the fate and achievements of the Jewish scholars who took refuge from the Nazi regime in Britain, the United States, and other places. And, but I, and I particularly want to emphasize the role of exiles in intellectual 
innovation. <clears throat> Actually, a few months ago, I was invited to take part in a conference about the um, religious um, uh, it, uh, my migration in early modern Europe. And but I wanted to keep close to this theme of innovation, which particularly fascinates me. So I offered um, the organizers a paper about 16th century heretics. I tried to look at innovations in theology at the time of the Reformation um, in the light of recent, relatively recent sociological theories of innovation, um, which might well have been thought a bit shocking by the original theorists, framed their theories to explain innovation in business and innovation in science. But it is, I think, intellectually useful as well as intellectually exciting sometimes to pursue a theory as far as it will go and maybe even one or two steps beyond. I'll come back to that. Um, or maybe, yes, I, I thought particularly useful in the context of the Reformation was what has been written in the last 20 years or so about the creative city, that is the kind of city that will attract creative people. The theory distinguishes between two stages. In the first stage, creative immigrants are attracted to one city rather than another city because of the range of facilities it offers. Um, for example, the presence of a good university, um, but, not, um, but, but also much more informally, um, the presence of plenty of bars and cafes where people with um, unusual ideas and try them out in conversation, argument with colleagues. But then in the second stage, a new wave of creative people will go to that city because they know that a group of creative people are already established there. So returning to the 16th century and the age of the Reformation, I focused on two cities in particular. One was Strasbourg and the other one was Basel. So in the first stage, the crucial factor was the, because um, of the decentralization of that part of Europe where the people who um, ruled the city were not subject to people who were ruling a state. And that meant um, Basel and Strasbourg continued to be a safe haven for people with unorthodox religious ideas. And um, a second um, attraction of the city was the number of printers in both places because we're talking about unorthodox theologians who are extremely um, keen to put their unusual ideas into print and to circulate them. And then in the second stage, just as the theory of the creative city predicts, some unorthodox people arrived because they knew that some famous unorthodox people were already there and they wanted to talk to them. That goes back to a Polish nobleman called uh, Jan Łaski, who went to Basel because he knew Erasmus was living there. 
and liked it and stayed. But now I turn to the challenges before moving on to the responses. I begin with the painful business of being uprooted from one's home, one's family, one's native culture. It's a kind of loss of identity that makes exile a traumatic experience for some people. Homesickness was recognized as an illness already in Switzerland in the 18th century. Theodore Adorno, returning from his exile in the United States after the death of Hitler, described every intellectual in his position as damaged by their years away from home. Today, some therapists specialize in the problems of refugees and in particular, their anxiety, their insecurity. In the 1930s, a famous Hungarian Jewish physicist in exile never unpacked his suitcase because he wanted um, to be able to move at five minutes notice in case his safe haven turned out not to be so safe after all. Where the suicides of some exiles remind us of how serious these problems can be. The famous name, the German philosopher, Walter Benjamin, also the German art historian, Max Raphael, the German historian, Theodor Mommsen, the Austrian historian of science, Edgar Zilsel, who was so lonely on the campus of a small liberal arts college in the Middle West that he took his own life. Uh, the Austrian writer, Stefan Zweig, not to mention the quasi suicide of Zweig's friend and compatriot, Josef Roth, who drank himself to death. Suicides of female exiles seem not to happen so often, but they include two more German intellectuals, the historian Hedwig Hinzer and the art historian Enna Liebreich. But, but of course, to survive in a new environment also meant and means facing a whole series of practical problems. In the first place, the problem of making a living, finding work. It was often unskilled and poorly paid work that represented a loss of human dignity for formerly successful lawyers, doctors, professors, engineers, and so on. And that went with the problem of finding somewhere to live, having had a big house in the homeland, but living in a single room in the host land and struggling to find the rent. And these practical problems, of course, raised psychological problems in their turn. Take the case of Siegfried Krakauer, a German Jewish journalist active in Berlin until 1933. Then he moved to France living hand to mouth, as he put it later, in a precarious existence that demanded constant improvisation. And then France was invaded by the Germans in 1940, and Krakow escaped to the United States. There, he wrote about his relief, I quote, to feel firm ground under my feet a vivid phrase which allows us to imagine the insecurity he had felt earlier. And so far, I haven't mentioned one of the biggest problems, the problem of resistance to the newcomers on the part of 
the natives of the country to which they've moved. It ranged from simple prejudice against foreigners to more sophisticated criticisms of the way in which they thought and practiced their particular intellectual discipline. As one British sociologist recently remarked, exiled intellectuals, especially academics, they confront a pre-existing academic field which already has its distinctive practices and its distinctive power relationships from all of which they are excluded at least until they finally learn the rules of the new game. And of course, an obvious problem for exiles, that of understanding the culture of the hostland, adapting insofar as they can to its customs. For many of them, this problem included learning a new language. Um, not always easy. Leonardo Olschke, uh, an Italian refugee from fascism who moved to the United States, once um, described the English spoken by himself and his fellow refugees as desperanto. For scholars in the humanities who wish to continue publishing their research, the problem of language is obviously acute. As the art historian Erwin Panofsky, who found refuge in the United States in the 1930s, as he pointed out, the refugee scholar faces a grave dilemma. I, I quote, when he writes himself in a language other than his own, he will hurt the reader's ear by unfamiliar words, rhythms, and constructions. But if he has his text translated, he'll address his audience wearing a wig and a false nose. As you can see, Panofsky disproves Panofsky because he's managed to write those sentences in an elegant and amusing English. But I think, generally speaking, what he says about refugee English um, is valid. In a later generation, um, 1970s, the Polish sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, who began a new life in Britain at this time, confessed, I quote, during a long time, I did not have the courage to write in English. And he explained, you cannot be really creative in a language you have not mastered completely. So the first book that Bauman published in English um, did not do very well. It was a study of the British labor movement. Um, it was reviewed by the famous historian, Edward Thompson, who totally misunderstood what Bauman was trying to do. Um, Thompson, maybe a bit egocentrically, thought this was a contribution to the debate about the working class that followed the publication of Thompson's own book in 1963, The Making of the English Working Class. But Bauman, who had been thinking about the book while still living in Poland, and who was a sociologist, he wanted to make certain general points, not points about England in particular. And indeed, some of them were faintly disguised points about Poland. And um, I'm sorry to say that Thompson, a great man in many ways, was a rather um, ethnocentric Englishman. He viewed Bauman's book as he viewed the work of another famous Polish exile intellectual, Leszek 
Kowakowski, he viewed both books as what he called contrary to the English idiom, which he described, this is, these are his own words, Protestant, individualist, empirical, disintegrative of universals, a hostility to theory, which is slightly odd coming from the mouth of an English Marxist. Eventually, however, Bauman did become famous in the English speaking world, following a series of books written in English about what he called liquid modernity. And then one might say that the advantages of exile began to kick in because he, be, he gained an international reputation that would have been difficult, if not impossible, to acquire if he had gone on writing in Polish. I once went to a conference in the United States where Fernand Brodel, the many people would have said the greatest living historian at, this, at that time, 1978, and he was receiving an honorary degree. And at the end of the conference, Brodel made a speech and he said something I never expected to hear him say, which was that another historian, a Polish historian, was more intelligent than he was. He was referring to the economic historian, Witold Kula. But then Brodel went on to make um, a very interesting point, which was that he knew he was much more famous than Kula, but then he had the French loudspeaker and Kula only had the Polish loudspeaker. So where you are speaking from, in what country you live, affects your reputation maybe more than the degree of intelligence or originality that you possess. It's a pity, but it seems that that is how things are. <coughs> and that example will, will bring me to the positive aspects of the experience of exile, including the creative responses to new problems in an unfamiliar culture. <coughs> A recent biographer of Bauman suggests that he transformed into an asset a series of forced migrations that could have been disadvantageous or even disastrous in many lives. I should say, Bauman living in English was in England was not Bauman's first choice. He went to Israel and then he found he couldn't settle down and moved on to England after that. And of course, Bauman was not alone in having these difficulties. Other intellectuals also adapted as he did, and some of them were more creative in their new life than they had ever been in their old one. Let's for a moment return to Krakow. As I said, he was a Berlin journalist. In Paris, he survived just about as a foreign correspondent for the Berlin newspaper, sending them reports about France. Then he went to the United States and he could not practice as a, journalism, as a journalist at all. So he responded by turning a former hobby into his profession. Krakow had always been a film fan. He grew up with the cinema, but he became an influential film theorist at a time when film studies were 
a relatively new form of academic activity. <clears throat> or again, a group of German speaking anti-Nazi lawyers who took refuge in the United States quickly discovered that the major differences between the legal system at home and the legal system in the United States would make it impossible for them to practice their profession. Instead, they turned to the study of international relations, where a knowledge of law was an asset. But still more important, this was a new discipline. New disciplines are likely to be much more open to outsiders than old established ones. So other new disciplines that offered particularly accessible niche for the newcomers, besides film studies and international relations, I would mention sociology and art history as the careers of exiles, famous ones like Karl Mannheim, and as I said, Erwin Panofsky, abundantly illustrate. Now, different individuals, according to temperament, followed different strategies in responding to the challenges of exile. I believe the two strategies, actually two opposite strategies, were particularly important. One of them, the more common one, may be described in two words as cultural translation, that is, making a career of explaining their homeland to their hostland. The second strategy, the bold one, was to study the hostland itself, examining it with the distance of an outsider and telling their hosts things that they didn't know about themselves. I'm going to discuss these two strategies now one by one. So as an example of a successful cultural translator, I should like to give you Isaiah Berlin, born in Riga while it was still part of the Russian Empire and leaving still a child with his parents soon after the Bolshevik Revolution and coming to Britain. Although Berlin continued all his life to speak with a very strong Russian accent, as I remember, because I attended his lectures in Oxford in the 1950s. Berlin adapted himself very well to English culture. Indeed, he was probably the most famous living British intellectual in the 1950s. Indeed, it might be said that Berlin adapted rather too well because he never acquired the critical distance from the hostland that is characteristic of so many other immigrant intellectuals. Active as a philosopher and also a historian of ideas, publishing well-known studies of Machiavelli, Rico and Herder, Berlin spent part of his time explaining Russian culture to the Anglophone world. And in my view, his best work uh, it consists of his essays on Russian thinkers of the 19th century. So at this point, I now want to return to Panofsky, who achieved a quite remarkable success as a professor of art history in the United States. And part of the secret, as you might have guessed from the passage I quoted, 
was his ability to adapt, even to make jokes in the new culture. But even more important was the fact he had something new to say, by which I mean something that was new in the host land, although it was becoming quite familiar in his homeland. In the United States, art history was still viewed only as the history of style. But for some decades in Germany, interest had grown in for art historians to study the meaning, content, or iconography of works of art as well as their style. In Britain, a similar success to Panofsky was enjoyed by an art historian he knew quite well, though he didn't like him very much, um, Edgar Wind. Edgar Wind became the first professor of art history ever in Oxford, thanks to his friend Isaiah Berlin, um, who was a great figure in university politics, managing to persuade people to found the chair. So Edgar Wind arrived in Oxford as a professor with no students. There was no course in art history. But that, that too was a challenge to which he adapted very well because he gave lectures that drew in students from almost all the disciplines studied in the university. Um, I went to the lectures myself, so did my friends who studied philosophy, mathematics, chemistry, and other subjects. They came in such numbers that the university could not find a lecture room that would hold everybody. And so Wind was moved to the local theater. Only there were there enough seats. And a younger art historian, the Austrian Ernst Gombrich, later became even more famous than Wind in the course of their exile in Britain. Gombrich became director of what in English we call the Warburg Institute. That is the reincarnation of the private library of Abi Warburg, um, great scholar of the Renaissance. Uh, and the library was transported to, from Hamburg to England in 1933, together with all its staff, and it was incorporated into the University of London. Warburg therefore became Warburg. Another exiled historian, the classical scholar Arnaldo Mamigliano, may not have had the same success with hundreds of students as that enjoyed by Wind, but in, instead, he was extremely influential on younger English scholars to whom he introduced the study of historiography and more generally the history of ideas, which at the time that Marmigliano was living in England from the late thirties to um, his death, in, in those early years, um, 30s, 40s, 50s, these subjects were not taken very seriously in Britain. Indeed, Momigliano used to say, only half joking, that in England, he said, whenever I mention the word idea, somebody gives me the address of the Warburg Institute. His passion for the history of historical thought was perceived by older British scholars as somewhat eccentric, although it was appreciated by younger scholars, including myself. I was lucky enough to be introduced to Marmigliano in 1965, which gave me 20 years of, of frequent 
conversations, or more exactly, it was a single conversation which had many installments. Now, I promised to say something more about the theory of innovation. One American theorist, the philosopher Donald Schoen, defined innovation as the displacement of ideas. In other words, he's saying, nothing is ever completely new. What we perceive is new, as new is a successful adaptation, re-employment of something older. Now, he might have added, though he did not add, that displaced ideas are often carried from place to place by displaced people. And those people then adapt the ideas that they carry with them to the new context, just like Panofsky and Rindt, taking examples that are familiar in the host land. In, in Vint's case, he started to lecture on 18th century British art. Only when he was established, he went back to his first love, the Italian Renaissance. So, so one could say that these exiles acted as cultural translators. And a few refugee scholars became translators in the literal sense of the word. Some German sociologists in exile in the United States made the ideas of Max Weber better known by translating them into English. And in similar fashion, Weber was translated into Spanish in Mexico by um, Spanish refugees uh, after Franco won the Spanish Civil War. So that's the first strategy. And now I want to say something about the second. It's riskier, but I think it sometimes pays off. And that is the exiles who choose to write about their new home. One famous case which really worked for him is that of another German art historian in Britain, Nicholas Pepsner. As a refugee in Britain, um, he was asked to give some lectures by the BBC. And he, um, he gave them and published them as a book under the title, The Englishness of English Art. Um, the, Englishness of English art, one might say, had been taken for granted by the English themselves rather typically. So it took a German to tell them what was English about their own style of painting and architecture. Pepsner became even more famous among a much wider audience when he published a series of books about the buildings of England, one volume to each county. Today, um, a generation after his death, and if somebody wants to know more about a certain English street or church or country house, then we still say, ah, let's look it up in Pepsner. So he became, if you like, an English institution. A younger man named Gerhard Ehrenberg came to England at the age of 17, together with his father, the distinguished ancient historian, Victor Ehrenberg. Young Gerhard immediately decided, so he wrote later, that England was the country that he ought to have been born in. So he changed his name to Geoffrey Elton, and he became the leading English expert on the reign of King Henry VIII. Later on, he advised his students at Cambridge to concentrate 
on what he called our history, meaning English history, rather than ranging more widely in the rest of Europe, not to speak of the rest of the world. But I, that's not a bold choice. Some bolder exiles made use of the fresh eyes of the outsider to challenge the collective self images of hostlanders. In this respect, we might compare the vision of the exile to that of Hans Andersen's famous child who immediately sees that the emperor is not wearing any clothes while the adults around him all deny this. So let me take an example this time, not of an academic, but of an intellectual humorist, George Mikesh. Mikesh was a Hungarian journalist. He was sent to London in 1938 to cover the story of the Munich crisis. But once he was in London, he decided not to go back. So he began working for the BBC as a kind of cultural translator. But at the same time, that was his day job. In the evening, he introduced Londoners to political cabaret of the kind that was familiar in his native Budapest, but was a novelty in London. And then after the war, he published his most famous book. Um, it has an intriguing title. You may have seen it, How to Be an Alien. It was written for English readers, but it makes a lot of fun of English habits and prejudices, especially the English view of two, um, of two subjects, sex and foreigners. Uh, the book became a runaway bestseller and it still is 76 years later. At a more academic level, another bold spirit was the historian Ludwig Bernstein Nemirovsky, born in a part of Poland under Russian control before the First World War. He was sent, his father was well off and sent Ludwig to Oxford to study. So technically speaking, he was not an exile, but he had very good reason, very good safety reasons for not going back to his homeland um, uh, um, by the time he was an adult. He became a great Anglophile. Like, like Elton, he changed his name from Nemirovsky to Namia and from Ludwig to Lewis. And he made his reputation with the study of 18th century England. Now, Namia had not been to school in England. He arrived as a young adult. It's that, it, an apparent disadvantage that turned out to be a great advantage. My point is, Namia had never been taught the traditional interpretation of 18th century English political history as the struggle between two parties, the progressive Whigs on one side, the conservative Tories on the other. Now, free from the conventional wisdom, Namir discovered that the majority of members of parliament in the 18th century, I mean, he studied them one by one, uh, a kind of collective biography. He discovered the majority were country gentlemen who had absolutely no interest in party struggles or even in political ideas. They chose to be elected to parliament in order, as somebody wrote in the 18th century, to make a figure in their own locality, fare bella figura. And in his dismissal 
of Whigism and Toryism. Namia was also inspired by the famous sociologist at that time, virtually unknown in Britain, and that is Wilfredo Pareto, actually an engineer turned economist turned sociologist, whose sociology, as I expect you know, emphasized the role in political life of interests rather than ideas. Now, to my mind, Namia's career illustrates quite nicely the famous discussion of innovation by the Austrian economist Josef Schumpeter, himself an emigre to the United States, though once again, not exactly an exile. Schumpeter was especially interested in the problem how can one encourage innovation in the world of business? He approached the problem in an original manner by turning it upside down. That is, he decided to focus on the obstacles to innovation. And especially, according to him, mental habits. It was awareness of the power of habit that led Schumpeter uh, in, in his most famous single phrase to recommend the need for creative destruction. An idea that is now commonplace in business studies, although at least in the English speaking world, it's been watered down and people talk not of destruction, but creative disruption, which is some quite considerably weaker. Needless to say, resistance to innovation is no monopoly of business people. It can be found in the academic field all too often. In the history of science, think of resistance to the ideas of Galileo, and after that, to the ideas of Darwin, and again, uh, to, to ideas of the German physicist, Max Planck. It was Planck who made the bitter observation that science progresses, as he put it, from funeral to funeral. Because, I quote, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and the new generation grows up that is familiar with the new idea and therefore not hostile to it. Trying to look at, at the problem uh, very briefly from the point of view of the opponents of innovation. Let me suggest established scholars in a given culture, including the culture of a particular discipline, have necessarily made a psychological investment in the conventional wisdom in their particular field. That investment would lose its value if that paradigm were to be replaced by another. On the other hand, outsiders to the culture, including exiles, have not made this investment. They are therefore less afraid of creative destruction. That liberates them to some degree. In other words, cultural distance, which I know uh, everybody knows often leads to misunderstandings, may sometimes lead to important insights as well. Like anthropologists in the field, exiled scholars preserve a certain detachment from their new culture. Uh, let me offer yet another example of 
um, an exile in England. Ernest Gellner came to Britain from Prague when he was a teenager because his family was Jewish and the Germans had just taken over Czechoslovakia. He went to school in Britain. He went to Oxford. He studied philosophy. After the war, he, he launched a devastating attack on the dominant school of philosophy in Britain, a form of linguistic analysis, which was known at the time, I don't know about now, as Oxford philosophy. This attack um, delivered, I can say, I was in the audience once at Oxford when he came and gave a talk, he, he, which he gave with great brio, knowing that he was irritating a number of colleagues in the room and preserving his serenity when he very quietly and, and in a very cool manner, he answered their irritated objections. But of course, um, being um, a critic of Oxford philosophy when it was dominant made it impossible for him to find a, um, a job in England as a philosopher. Well, his solution to the problem was to retrain as a social anthropologist, a discipline in which cultural distance is, of course, an asset rather than a liability. Another example, Hungarian again, the sociologist Karl Mannheim also turned his detachment into both practice and theory. Mannheim was actually an exile twice over. In 1919, he fled his native Hungary to escape the regime of Bela Kun. He made what might be called a soft landing in Germany. His mother was German and German culture had a dominant place in Hungary in the first part of the 20th century. So he studied in Heidelberg, uh, just missing Max Weber who had, had died only a year or so before. And then he, he moved from philosophy to sociology and he became a professor in Frankfurt. But unfortunately, three years after his appointment as full professor, he had to flee again, 1933, and he went to England. I'm sorry to say he found England a much less sympathetic environment to be exiled in than Germany had been. That his creative response was to follow both the two strategies I mentioned earlier. So in the first place, Mannheim tried to act as a mediator or cultural translator between two styles of thought, as he called them, the more theoretical German style and the English or Anglo-American empiricist style. He complained of what, I, what he called the urgent need and the great difficulty of translating one culture in terms of another, by which he meant explaining sociology to the English. Incidentally, um, this complaint is one of the first times, um, that, as far as I know, that this phrase, cultural translation, was ever used. But Mannheim was not only a translator of German culture, he was a critic of the culture that he encountered in his second exile, especially its overemphasis in his eyes on empiricism. He once wrote to his American friend, the sociologist Louis Worth, complaining that there was no tradition of sociology in Britain, while admitting that what he called the best of sociological thought was to be found not in books on the subject, 
but in books about anthropology, history, and social psychology. Mannheim became well known for the idea that intellectuals float free from society. In other words, they're detached from it, which means that they are able to look beneath its surface to unmask it. And he particularly emphasized the role of refugee intellectuals like himself, forcibly detached from their home culture, not yet fully attached to their new culture. It might be for the, for the individual involved, assisted them in what Mannheim called the acquisition of perspective. In other words, a distance from the conventional wisdom in both homeland and hostland that encouraged original thought. In short, and to conclude, I'd argue that intellectuals in exile from the 16th century to the 20th, if not the 21st, have made a major contribution to intellectual innovation. Uh, returning to the idea of freedom with which I began, one might say that liberation from what Nietzsche called the prison of language and what Brodel called the long-term prisons of mental frameworks has often been the result of awareness of alternative styles of thought. This awareness of alternatives is necessarily part of the everyday experience of exiles in their daily navigation between two cultures. Happily, intellectuals in exile have be, been able to communicate this awareness of alternatives to some people in their new home, notably to their students when they taught in universities. Personally, I remain grateful for having been lucky enough to have been one of those students. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much for this very rich and thought-provoking lecture, which helped us to shed some light on the complex nexus between um, the conscious and subconscious aspects of the experience of the exiles and their impact as cultural and the different impact as cultural translators. Now I will leave the floor to Esther Gallo and Rosa Salzberg. They both teach here at the Department of Sociology. Uh, Esther Gallo is professor of social anthropology and Rosa Salzberg is professor of early modern history. And they both have expertise in um, mobility and migration issues. The floor is yours. I see. I'll stay here. And so um, thank you very much, Professor Burke. Uh, as an anthropologist, mm -hmm. I always found uh, true inspiration from, from your work. But I, I have to say that this is even more true uh, since I started to work on exiled uh, scholars in, in the present uh, and to work with exiled scholars uh, within the project of uh, uh, reception and inclusion of them. And, and Everything I read in your work and everything I heard today uh, reminds me of very obvious things that what we experience now is not new and that there is a lot about uh, that we can learn about the experiences of exiled intellectuals in the past to see and to read and to filter what we are uh, experiencing uh, today. And um, 
starting from two points that I, I, I find particularly inspiring, linking intellectual exile to freedom and academic freedom. Yes. The, the academic freedom is a, is a right, is a principle that is not only individual, hmm, is, is bound to be a member of a community. And we learn from, from your work that exile implies the erosion, the traumatic uprootedness from a previous community and the difficult uh, attempt at rebuilding a community in the homeland or at, at, in the host land or at keeping connection with, with the homeland. And, and, and it, certainly exiled intellectuals have a cognitive privilege in many ways, but as you stressed uh, and, and critically to what Manem was saying, they're not flea floating, uh, deterritorialized. Uh, that would be very uh, romanticist, uh, snobbish to some, somehow. They're not flea floating intellectuals. They are intellectuals whose history of exile is intimately linked to the history of institutions, of disciplines, and of a hostland and a homeland. And it is a history of rejection also. And, and so it's, it's uh, with Merton, it's a history of ambivalence in their, in their trajectory. And, and it's a history that inevitably attempt at assessing what we gain if in Europe, in the US, we accepted to, to use a term uh, by Lewis Posser, deprovincialize UK University, American University, uh, but is also a loss that uh, was immense for the countries that lost these exiles. And, and this, I think, invites me to think of the present and the responsibilities that societies and universities and cities in Italy, in Europe, have towards exiled scholars. And what can we uh, actually build? To what extent we are open to pluralism, to new idea, comparing the universities 50 or 70 years ago and comparing the universities now, I don't know, I would see a much gloomier uh, environment, but I'd like to know more, I mean, about, about this. Um, the stories that we know are inevitably and probably predictably histories of success. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a substratum of thinking of your book of ignorance, a huge histories of scholars that we don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and who may have uh, actually produced unconventional knowledges that may not be inside university, recognized as legitimate, but still I think would be worth uh, studying these unconventional uh, knowledges. Um, the anthropologist, I was, I was, I was putting myself as a, I'm an anthropologist. So if we think of Gellner uh, adopting the critical stance, the, the cognitive privilege and detachment that as anthropologists would be supposed to have when they move to a place to study. What these anthropologists don't have and ordinary anthropologists have is to go back to their host institution to translate, also for the other part. So I wonder the history that we know more is the contribution that exiled scholars have made as anthropologists to those who were ready to listen, the receiving country. What about the possible return of ideas back in the country that exiled uh, there? Um, and then if I have two minutes, just to, to remark. Uh, one, it's uh, about the women. Uh, in, in your book, 
uh, you list 100 refugee scholars. Um, and, and I find interesting that sometimes we use exile and refugee for women. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think it's worth a reflection. The, the, the limited knowledge we have as sociologists and anthropologists about women, exiled women intellectual, is that in the relocation, they were often uh, offered jobs as domestics, as nannies, as babysitters. Uh, so this label that Anna Harent hated, we, we don't want to be called refugees, was particularly infantilizing and penalizing for women. Should you rewrite this book by putting the 100 women from the index into the main thread of the book. What role would they play? Cultural translator, cultural uh, resistant, uh, cultural critic. Yeah, and thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say first that it's it's just a great honor to have Peter Burke here, um, that his, your works have been a kind of signposts for me throughout my career as a historian, but also particularly um, in, in my first year here teaching in the University of Trento in the sociology department as a historian, your book on history and social theory is, has been my <laughs> Bible and I recommend it to my students who are sociology students studying historical methods. So um, I'm very pleased to be able to, to respond to the wonderful lecture that you gave. Um, so my work as a historian is mostly focused on the social and cultural history of migration and mobility recently, um, looking particularly at, at the case of Venice, which you started with actually. And, um, and particularly my interest is, is, I guess, in the kind of practical mechanics of mobility and migration and what it, you know, what it means to move and the kind of difficulties that, that people face as they move around. So I, I found your lecture and your book particularly um, helpful and interesting from that point of view. And I guess my questions and comments come out of that perspective in particular. Um, so a couple of things. One of the things that struck me as I was listening to the lecture and you sort of started with this point was I think one of the things that we get so helpful from your work of taking a long-term perspective on this topic is, um, is this history of sort of openings and closings of places, you know, you started with the example of Venice and then closing, becoming more closed uh, to, to migrants and exiles after the Council of Trent. Um, and it's something that we do see continually throughout history. And I think even at the recent years of COVID, I was talking about this with my students yesterday, actually, have made us see in new ways, um, you know, obviously new kind of restraints on movement, new kind of uh, rejection of different kinds of people for reasons that aren't just political or religious, but also, you know, medical. Um, but I think in, in some ways that all taking the long view also allows us to see that, um, you know, there are openings as well as closings. So it's not all a sort of a negative story. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about, particularly as I was listening to the lecture, was the role of, of cities in particular as places of reception or not for exiles and migrants. And again, you gave some examples. And um, I was curious if you had more thoughts on, I mean, you were talking about the example of creative cities, but um, what what is it about particular cities that make them more or less hospitable to different kind of uh, exiled intellectuals? bigger cities versus smaller cities, more central versus more peripheral. Um, and I was, again, I mean, Venice is a great example of the importance of the political regime of the, you know, the presence of other kind of migrant communities. Another example that I find really fascinating is um, the creation of Hollywood in Los Angeles and the role of uh, Jewish um, exiles or children of second generation exiles in, you know, a place that is, in a sense, a new industry, a new city in many ways, and it's a, a kind of a fertile space for people to create a new, a new um, cultural industry. So I wondered if you had any more thoughts about what is it about particular kind of cities that um, 
you know, create more fertile environments for people to down roots in some ways. Um, I also was interested, um, as Esther was saying in the study, the importance, I think, of studying, you know, the failures. And, I mean, you the failures. You, you emphasise in your lecture how important it is also to recognise the emotional toll of exile and to the point of suicide in some, in some cases. And um, I wondered, you know, as I, I too, I think this is a really important topic to study and from a methodological point of view, as so I, I teach historical methods to sociology students, as I said, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts also on how, how we can study the sort of failed cases and the cases of wasted talent, of people that didn't um, end up managing to contribute what they might have contributed. Um, another, another question that I had was also, uh, one of the things that was striking me actually when I was reading your book and then again listening to the lecture was um, the way in which we, might conceive of migrants or refugees as bodies or minds. And that the way in which a lot of the discourse, popular discourse about migration and refugees can conceive them as sort of bodies and, and particularly the way they get, um, they get used in a sense by different societies. So if we think of the kind of jobs that throughout history, refugees tend to have to do, it is often menial labor of literally using their bodies as Esther has said, cases of domestic service. Or, you know, I mean, even in 16th century Venice in the history that I write, you know, people rowing gondolas or carrying things around the city or working as domestic servants. And, and we talk about, you know, there's talk about swarms of migrants and migrants dying on boats and these kind of questions. And yet, as your work shows, obviously, the importance of thinking about migrants, refugees, also as mines. Um, but, but I was struck also by, in a sense, and I think similar point to what Esther was making, but the need to think about these two kind of things together. So these are, there are all of these cases of important um, minds who've contributed a great deal. And yet you, you also need to think about and understand the practical material circumstances in which they were trying to make new lives for themselves, what it meant for them to move, what kind of practical, you know, you mentioned a few examples of the need to pay the rent, you know, the difficulties of getting a job, uh, the difficulties of language, of literally just being able to speak and communicate. Um, so the importance of sort of thinking both of, of, of the intellectual but also in a very kind of practical and material context as well. Um, so I think they were most of the, the questions or comments that I had. Um, I, and I just wanted to conclude by saying, um, that I, I just think your work is so valuable for showing the crucial importance of this kind of mobility of, um, of people to the mobility of ideas and the history of knowledge. And also, but at the same time, also highlighting obstacles to this. Actually, I had one more question I just forgot. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was also the, the whether you think that these kind of exiles and, and expatriates have a particular importance in the history of interdisciplinarity and I was struck by some of the examples that you gave of people having to cross disciplines or choosing to have changed jobs and whether I think in a sense you've answered that question a bit in your lecture but I wondered if you had any more to say about the role of, of um, migrants in the, the history of interdisciplinarity. To, to reply to, to these comments. Okay, a few um, <clears throat> responses on uh, off the top of my head. First of all, thank you very much for um, these perceptive comments. <clears throat> um, too many points to answer without giving another lecture really. But um, on the question of terminology and who's in exile and who isn't, I decided it would be best um, to make a very big distinction between people who wanted to leave, whom I call the expatriates, and people who didn't want to leave for whatever reason, whether it's the um, political reasons that traditionally have been called exile, or the um, fear of being um, killed or at least imprisoned 
um, which leads to the condition of the refugee. Incidentally, refugee is quite an old word. Um, it's often thought that it's a 20th century term, but it started in the late 17th century with the French Protestant refugee in, when they arrived in uh, the Dutch Republic, it was called the refuge. And then um, some of them came to England. So then um, they were called um, ref refugee there because there wasn't an English word and it was the French one was used instead. About, so I would say anthropologists are expatriates and not exiles. And I'm, I think it would be very interesting to have a study. This would be a bit like an anthropology of anthropology or a psychology of anthropology. Do they go through the same trauma, but in a milder form um, while they're doing their field work? They often say they've had the time feeling lonely and anxious. Um, but the crucial thing is the expatriate knows that he or she has got a return ticket. Effect. And that, I think that makes a huge difference to the way that you confront the situation. Um, about the question of women, I'm, um, which I put into an appendix in the book, and it was very, I found it very interesting to study 100 biographies of female refugees in the 30s. Um, I didn't say much about it generally. Uh, the most obvious thing was compared to men, the women were more adaptable. They were more prepared to take jobs. Um, several became waitresses, some became nannies. Um, and you don't find um, very many male refugees being, of course, these are middle-class academics. It seems to be unthinkable to them to take a job which almost sooner starve than take a job that's below one in social status. Um, maybe there is the occasional exception, but that might have something to do with age. Um, Leopold Etlinger, art historian, was relatively young teenager, I think, when he came to England, and he immediately became a social worker. And then there was, um, let me think, somebody, um, yes, there's a, a, a distinguished um, German Jewish become British historian of the 19th century, who became the guard, a gardener at Peter House in Cambridge. And then um, he tried to transfer to, to be a student, um, but they wouldn't let him, which is, I think, extraordinary since there was his um, success at school in Germany was documented. And I think he was bitter about that all his life. But so those are cases of young people who actually did take a job with lower status. Um, Otherwise, I just say that um, there's one word I didn't use this time, but maybe it's the single word that uh, sums up the message I was trying to communicate, and that is deprovincialization. So the, the exiles first deprovincialize themselves, and then they deprovincialize at least some select members of the um, hostland. That, that is, the, is the most positive thing that can be said about this collective movement, which includes us a lot of suffering as well. So thank you very, thank you very much, Esther and Rosa, for your comments. Uh, Professor Berg, for your reaction to these comments. I think we can now open the floor to questions from the audience, starting from the participants in the room. Are there any questions? Maybe Ryan? Yeah. I think we can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
again. Um, okay, so hi. Uh, and first, thank you very much for your. Okay, so thank you very much for your lecture. It was really interesting. Um, particularly because I'm not a historian, I'm a sociologist, so it was a very nice approach to hear. Um, I have a question regarding the two strategies that you uh, laid out for uh, intellectual in, in exile. So my question is more regarding the present and the future of these strategies, because right now we live in a world where with internet and social networks and uh, the shared research forums that exist online, uh, ideas travel, can travel and are shared much more in a much more easier way, more easy way. Um, and so sometimes it's not even necessary to actually be present in our country in order to be successful and famous in that country, um, which also means that is there still um, an advantage in being present in the country in order to be successful in it. So I guess my question is, is it still going to be relevant for exiled intellectuals to become mediators um, or to challenge the collective self-image uh, if those mediators and translators and challengers already exist in an online world? Um, and so the host country actually already has those kind of contribution. That is a good question. If you could summarize it. Yes, we can. We can. Maybe I can just summarize the question that Viola asked. Um, so she was saying um, that now with the with the internet and with the online world, in a sense, it's much easier to share ideas and to transmit ideas across space than it was in the past. And whether, um, if I, I hope I express this correctly, Viola, whether you think, in a sense, what what is the importance of the physical presence of exiles in a in a country now? when um, in a sense you, you can already share ideas so much more easily than in the past because of, because of the technology that we have. And so what difference does it make, do you think, having people physically present in, in, a new, in the host land as opposed to, you know, perhaps sharing ideas across the internet, if that makes sense? Yeah, in the, in the age of the internet, I suppose. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, naturally, I'm very, um, interested in the, the problem of people who are only just now going into exile for a variety of reasons. Now, it would be impossible at this point to say what the effects on, that, on them uh, and on the uh, countries that they go to um, would be, because in the cases that I gave, um, it took, I was talking with people who left in the 1930s, but most of the contributions they make are in the 50s and 60s. So we have maybe, um, I'm afraid we might have to wait some decades before a sensible answer could be given to that question. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Can you come, please? No. Um, I wanted uh, at the beginning of the encounter we um, you talked uh, to us. Uh, you taught us about the um, uh, creative cities that moved from Venice to Antwerp to Cracovia and all these uh, cities. And I wanted to ask if all these uh, creative people that actually went uh, for different reasons to these cities, left the legacies in, in those cities. And if we can see in, I don't know, with some medium, 
such as art or maybe like architecture or maybe science or maybe uh, universities, we can see uh, uh, those legacies that they left on, on, on these particular cities. Yeah, questions about the legacy, the impact of, of art um, on the cultural transfer, if I understood correctly, on the cities, on, 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 the, on the cities. Yeah, the impact that those creative people had had on those particular cities, like oh, if they oh. left uh, a mark. So it's the creative city again. And yes, and there's, clearly there is much more to say about the creative city. And um, it's been studied mainly by uh, the economists and sociologists who've been thinking understandably about the short term, that is the present and the foreseeable future. Whereas um, I come to this clearly um, with an interest in changes over the long term. So a question, as far as I remember, in the literature I read, a question that was never raised in the literature on the creative city is um, how long are certain cities creative for? I'm thinking of some cities becoming creative and some cities no longer becoming being creative, and I'm interested in what might be the explanations of this. I mean, let's say one case is that one city attracts creative people at the expense of another one. I think the relation between Antwerp and Amsterdam in the 16th and 17th century shows this kind of shift. Um, I think that some creative cities have benefited from being the capital of empires. So there were a number of reasons why that capital was a magnet to gifted people who came to pursue their careers. So we contrast Vienna when it was the capital of an empire and Vienna when it was the capital of a small state and it doesn't seem to have that power to attract people anymore. And, um, and the last point I want to make is I wonder whether there is an optimum size for creative cities, whether they have, um, they mustn't be too small. Um, what is it? But, um, I don't think they should be too big either, because if the creative people don't have a chance of encountering one another face to face easily, um, then um, it's likely that um, th that city will not um, support them in a positive way anymore. So um, probably um, it's, it's growth that is the danger. Um, people starting to live further away from one another and so not using the same cafes or bars. So then, then this, um, what um, some researchers have called buzz, this excitement of the exchange of ideas with people you know on a regular basis. It, um, it, it needs this kind of physical support that it's, it has to be not too much effort to meet the other people. And as the city grows, the amount of effort required grows with it. And I think that probably spells decline. But I'm getting ahead of myself because I think I'm talking about, this, once again, research that hasn't been done yet. Though I think that um, it looks to me very promising. Mm -hmm. There is a question online. Okay. There's a question um, from the audience uh, online. Um, so um, anonymous 
listener says, uh, thank you to Professor Burke. You distinguish between two different ways of being an intellectual in exile to adapt and live in their new life. And the person asks, could we look at the first, so the cultural translators, as outsiders that enrich the new culture with a different cultural background, and the second um, that go even further and bring their experience as exiles to give a new insight to both cultures. And they say that they're thinking, for example, of Hannah Arendt um, and perhaps also of Isaiah Berlin. So whether you think that this, the second, I've forgotten the second mm -hmm. kind of cultural translators and cultural media, uh, cultural critics, um, whether you think they, in a sense, go further and enrich both their own culture, the, the culture of the host land and the culture of the homeland as well, as in a case like Hannah Arendt, for example. I haven't really thought about that before. I remember that I will. Okay, something to think about. <laughs> we are facing some problems of cultural translation, it seems to me. Are there any other questions? Of your audience online? Yes. Go ahead, Esther. The privilege for other two questions. Uh, one is very, very uh, simple because I, I see the audience that are also uh, scientists from maths, from hard sciences. Was exile somehow different or easier for? Uh, for scholars working within the, the hard sciences like physics or chemistry, uh, if compared, or mathematics, if compared to those working in the humanities and uh, the social sciences? Well, I have to confess mm -hmm. my relative ignorance of um, the natural sciences, which really ought to disable me from giving a response, but I will give a general impression which I might find difficult to justify with many concrete examples. I think that the natural sciences travel more easily. That's just, um, and that means um, whatever the practical difficulties the scientists have, they share with people in the social sciences and the humanities. But when it comes to communicating with colleagues in their discipline, then they don't, I think, um, face the, the same degree. There may be some degree of um, misunderstanding, but I think enormously lower because at least in the 20th century, uh, science has managed to uh, um, create an international language. The most I would say is that there are certain tendencies that in, in physics, it seems that the more empiricist cultures do better at experimental physics and the more theoretical cultures like the German best at theoretical physics. And indeed there are some interesting cases of um, I think the, um, I'm, I'm following uh, one of the rare historians of science who's interested in this problem, Paul Koch. And he says that um, there was, you could say there was a case of cultural hybridity in physics among when a number of German physicists went to the United States and they were working alongside their North American colleagues, there was a gap in the sense that the Americans were, were still more empiricist and the Germans more theoretical, but the distance was not unbridgeable. And even some kind of compromise or hybridity was achieved. Now, I don't know whether that's a one-off example, he doesn't quote any others, or whether if one researched biology and chemistry and so on, one would find I think it would be fascinating to know if there are other cases. 
personally, I have never read about another one. Okay, other any questions? Yes, one there, yes. Last, two last questions, then we can collect both. It's fine. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Professor Burke. Um, I I was interested by the question about difference in disciplines, and I wanted to ask if you've also noticed difference. And um, you've mentioned mostly intellectuals that came from Europe and emigrated to the UK or the States. And I was wondering if you've seen or if you have any insight in uh, intellectual that. It were exiled from non-European countries, if there's any difference with their adaptation to the new host land. Yeah, I mean, I, once again, I missed it. Yeah, it's the question is about the difference concerning the, um, the, origin. the origins of, of the exiles. If they come from, so you focused on the European dimension, yeah. mostly on the European dimension, so the question is about uh, if you notice sort of some um, differences in considering also exiles from outside from Europe. No, I, I, I tried to gather some material on um, uh, exiles from China and exiles from Arab speaking countries in the Middle East, but I, ne I was never able to um, collect enough. Um, I know a little bit more about um, South American uh, exiles, especially in, after the military coup in Brazil and in the era of Pinochet in Chile and of course of the authoritarian regime in Argentina as well. But um, I, that seemed to me very much uh, very similar to the European diaspora. And in fact, it seemed um, not very difficult for the South American um, exiled intellectuals um, to fit into academic communities, um, not only in um, the English speaking world, but in places such as Norway. I'm trying to remember rather distinguished anthropologist, um, was it Eduardo Arquetti who took a job in Norway? So um, it would be, I think, more, um, more interesting if I only had the knowledge um, to follow the, um, the fortunes of, um, um, say, um, um, Syrian or Iraqi intellectuals, but um, um, I simply was never able to accumulate the biographical data on which this kind of generalization um, really needs to be based. <clears throat> Last question. Okay, I think time is running out. So I would like to Thank Professor Burke and uh, Mr. Gallo and Professor uh, Salzberg and all the participants on site online for the great discussion. And thank you again for your contribution.